Good. Okay, so welcome everyone to this uh, session on uh, uh, JDI, just uh, equi equitable, diverse, and, and inclusive assessment uh, um, working party session. Uh, we met earlier on as a, as a larger group, and many other people joined our, our working party, and these were the objectives we, we set out to, to work on, which is making assessment more inclusive across institutions uh, in, in the UK, in different departments, different subjects, everything all inclusive of that. Um, it's a big challenge, obviously, um, and which can only be uh, supported by meeting regularly and, and discussing and sharing practice and, and sharing lessons learned from um, both since the uh, from the pandemic and, and beyond. Um, so we, we will keep on arranging some of these sessions um, to, to allow that to happen, to share practice and learn from each other. Uh, in fact, we will reach out to other bodies such as uh, uh, TESO, Advanced HE, QA, PSRBs, etc., to also join us at, at different points and, and share their views and practice with us. Uh, and there will be opportunity for us to work on a on a systematic review of uh, of practice around inclusive assessment at some point, which we'll run a training session first of all, and then we'll recruit teams to to work on that collaboratively. Moving on from that point, um, just to remind ourselves of the goals, what we, uh, so you see a picture of uh, a Nobel laureate from 1913. His name is uh, Rabindranath Tagore. In his own words, uh, he, he, he uh, composed a poem, which is in Bengali. Obviously, this doesn't mean anything to, to anyone. In fact, it doesn't mean fully mm -hmm. To me as well, I'm not a Bengali speaker, but I can recognize some words because they have uh, common roots with Sanskrit, and I speak Hindi, so it's kind of related to, to um, yeah, so I can understand a little bit. Uh, so it says, uh, uh, if, sorry, yeah, it's this word means if your call is not heard, is not heard by anyone, you must walk alone, walk alone, walk alone, my friend, something like that. And if, if you were to read the actual translation, it's something like this. The song goes on. Uh, it talks about the progressive path. Uh, it talks about walking alone. talks about being fearless and not turning back. And others shall follow you is, is, is how the song goes. So that's probably what we are all trying to do in our institutions. We are... Uh, walking that path alone um, and, and, and making the little bit of change that we can to, to practice around, around uh, in inclusivity, inclusiveness. Another sort of example that uh, I, I think of is, is that of sharing um, light uh, from one uh, diya, diva, as it's called in Hindi, to, to another, or maybe, um, yeah, so it's, it's even in the darkest night when Diwali is celebrated, it's spreading light from one diva to another, brighten up the entire home, street, cities, world, one small deal at a time. Uh, taking an example from another culture, Chinese uh, Lantern Festival, it's, uh, there are multiple stories about why this is done, but uh, uh, the, the, the contrast here is thousands of, of lanterns in the sky uh, alongside a full moon night. That's when it's celebrated uh, to show that even established practices can be challenged if many, many, many small uh, efforts are done. So that's again a good uh, thing to, to think about. Again, be it other cultures where people are sharing hope and gifts and pleasantries with each other around festivals. So th this is just saying, you know, if, if little by little by little we can we can make big changes. Um, and and one such um, um, light or one such uh, person who's who's passed uh, who, who tread the path. Is, is one of our next presenters. And I think all, all the other presenters are, are in the same category. Uh, people have done different wonderful work and they're here to, to share with us. So I'm really, really grateful for that. So I'd like to hand over the, the floor to uh, Dr. Anne Notcliffe, who's from Canterbury Christchurch University, who has uh, created a school based on ADI principles. So Anne, over to yourself. Please do take your 30 minutes for or introduce, introducing yourself uh, a little bit about yourself and your work 
and followed by some question answers. And that's how we'll close the rest of the session. Thank you so much. Over to you. Thank you. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, I just switched off my microphone and said yes. No, we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, some of the challenges of working with Blackboard, once you share your slides, I can't see the chat. Um, so welcome. Um, my name is Dr. Anne Nortcliffe. I'm the founding head of the Engineering Technology and Design at here at Canterbury Christchurch University. And I've been in a very fortunate position to create a new school from scratch. That means from nothing being there, creating a physical space and bringing the staff. And the remit I was set was to create a completely EDI um, school. So I've been in a very privileged position to do that. And that has involved an awful lot of work. Um, and I'll, we will be focusing in on assessment, but I think you need to understand the context for that and the work that we have been doing. So we haven't just tackled the curriculum and the assessment. Um, why was it needed? Well, um, the UK has a skills gap. I noticed my spelling error. I'm dyslexic, so I apologise. Um, 137,000 um, need for this year alone in engineering. Um, the profession still recognises it keeps hiring white males um, and they need to be reflecting on that. They're missing out on talent. Um, both females and um, black and Asian students. Um, we're in the southeast and engineering is, is one of the biggest growth employment areas, hence um, the need to addressing this skills gap. And last year there was over two million vacancies um, on prospects related to technology. So as you can see, there is a desperate need for staff in this area and you know, if we're going to promote this out to students, the opportunities are there for employment prospects. Um, graduate engineering employment reality. Um, so this is this does impact what we do in our curriculum, but we need to be aware of this for preparing our students for the work environment they're going to. Um, so ethnicity, gender, low social economics, disadvantaged students and their employment prospects. Um, I did a piece of work in my previous institution and they are successfully placing um, over 50% of our students out on placement. And this was a big, I'm talking about big engineering and computing department. So we're talking about hundreds of students. Um, when I analysed down, only 11% of my black and Asian students were getting placements. And in actual fact, the black and Asian students, which were successfully getting placements, have English names. I will leave that for your understanding and thought. So this is some of the world of work they're going into and some of the challenges we have out there. Um, so back in the curriculum, back in the assessment, some of that is, as we know, um, there's a black attainment gap and that is an institutional problem. That is not, uh, it is academics and institution and curriculum problem um, that is occurring because if you look at the Rust Group students going in, they have the same qualifications. Black and Asian students from London, there is no attainment gap problem in schools. So we have created the problem in HE. And then that perpetuates for our students of having that attainment gap, um, awarding gap, particularly for black students, and that impacts their career progression and employment as well. So we, we have got to address our curriculum and our assessment as part of that equality. I'm not saying we're perfect, but we're doing a lot of our work to do what we're doing. But that places you some in context of why it is important we should be engaging with a more equality, diverse and inclusive assessment and curriculum because we have a direct impact on our students' future. In engineering, it's even more impactful. If we don't have people out into our engineering who are female, um, black and Asian, we will continue to produce products that only work for um, white males. Cars are a classic example. I can tell you now the IPD distance between your nose and the centre of your eye and the distance from the edge of your eye to your ear are smaller on women, which means our peripheral um, vision 
um, our vision around surround is different to a male, which means the pillars in the car, if they've been designed by white males, actually compound women in the car parking. So actually, we know statistically women have more car parking accidents than men. Um, but actually, I don't think it's about ability. It's about the fact that we have designed cars with pillars that women can't see because our visual difference, our surround spatial awareness is different because our eyes positioning is different to men. We know that profit increases if we have inclusive teams. So again, you know, the potential of economic growth, we can support UK PLC is absolutely imperative if we can address this awarding gap, ensuring our best, you know, the students all have that opportunity into employment, we can really help UK PLC's um, economic growth through that equality and diversity. So this is all placed in context for you of why, particularly in engineering, we have to address EDI. And as I say, London is 40% um, black and Asian community and um, society overall internationally is 51% female. So we shouldn't be, as I say, engineers shouldn't be engineering solutions that's only addressing 49% of the population. So how do we create um, an EDI school? Um, so we do a phenomenal amount of STEM outreach, um, which we won't focus here, but some of that work has to be even those exercises and learning exercises that you do in school. You need to be aware of some of the um, work that has been going on in STEM outreach hubs about the importance of how you conduct yourself. Um, and that we know that the wrong comment can impact whether a female will progress in STEM. So if you're into outreach activities, go and work with your STEM hub, but get training in EDI as well, because it's important, because that will impact you, impact your pipeline as student. Now, something which also impacts your curriculum is actually thinking about your facilities. Are your facilities and your resources and your staff EDI. So 38% of my staff are female. We've worked very hard to achieve that. We've written up the HR rule book to do that. Um, and I'm more than happy to share another time how we've gone about achieving that. And 65% of my staff are black and Asian. So we have those role models in there. And it's important you have role models of mature black and Asian and female staff in their 50s as well as the young staff, because for black and Asian students and female students, they need to see the role models that people continue in that career and that subject area. This is so important and that actually can impact students engagement in their studies and their willingness to achieve because they can see the end goal that in 30, 40 years, I can achieve that. I can be who they are. With regarding the estates, some of the things we've done is we have round tables or Ruclex triangle tables. The reason for this is, is to enable, particularly with group work, that people can't use their body language to exclude people. Um, when you're teaching a class and you've put them into group work, really stand still and look how your students are working. Look where your Asian and black students are sitting look where your white students sit, look how your males are sat relative to the female students. I've observed it so many times, particularly, you know, normally it has been a male who's used their physical presence on an oblong and a square table to physically exclude um, female students so they can't engage in the conversation and the exercise of learning that's occurring. Now, to be fair, I've also witnessed as part of our medical school recruitment, which I'm part of, actually a very well-educated private school, a young lady, use her same body language to exclude two Asian students um, from a group activity of assessment. So be aware of that. These are microaggressions that people do consciously or unconsciously. But as an academic, you should be challenging. 
and and bring it to their attention in private if that means taking the student out of the classroom and explaining what to them what they've done you might get a very angry response from the student but you need to highlight to them that they'll be going into a working environment and employers are more or less tolerant of this behavior now particularly going to an assessment center for graduate employment so you know don't be afraid to challenge it i have done in the past i have had very angry male engineering students in the corridor thinking i'm a waste of space explaining this to them but if i pointed out to them i care about their future and they need to change so think about your state, think about how you're setting up that group work and environment. Um, we do engage with employers and again, employers, it's really important if they're part of the assessment. So for us, we do, for the inclusive assessment areas, we do big capstone projects and we source those from industry. Um, we particularly identify what relevant about those projects and how we set that up and we're doing group work. How you create your groups is really important. So we do use a role play of Belbin. So we take it away from personalities and about skill sets and that helping the students to understand that you need. Um, it's about understanding those non-technical skills, and employability skills that are really important to teamwork and group work. Um, and playing to each other's strengths. Now, UCL do Clifford strengths. As I say, I use role play, um, Belbin and my team does. And we really explain, and we spent quite a lot of time with the students to help them and facilitate that. And that it's not about working with their mates. Usually, they're in the first year, they may have done that working with their mates. And then in the second year, we, we move more to this Belbin model. And it's interesting how much more the students are reflecting on that, or semester one, semester two, on, on that experience now of seeing actually that person over there they thought they didn't get on. They compliment them because they're opposites. And that's about inclusive assessment. It's helping them to work in a more inclusive, diverse way to support them. And it's also equally the assessment vehicles that we bring in. So um, in the case of last year, the students were designing a surgical tool for um, piles which is to be used in developing country. So it had to have single use and um, it must fail immediately after use, which I know for the students we had to bring that in to make them realize that um, from a sustainability perspective, it's still about sustainability because actually you don't want to reuse it because of the risk of SEP. But also it's getting them to realize that um, the majority of surgical instruments are designed for male hands. That means women are falling out, actually don't continue surgical careers because of the surgical instrumentation. So it may help them students understand that surgical instruments have got to be, in order to be British kite marked, British standard kite marked, they've got to consider it's got to work with a female hand as well as a male hand. So again, it's, it's, it's all, you know, it, that helps with inclusivity. If the assessment itself is encouraging the students to think about that inclusivity, about that assessment process and playing, you know, that, they, that, that a mixed group of male and female students actually bring in both their physical characteristics, which are going to be important for discussion about solving these engineering problems. <clears throat> Some of the works I would like to cite you to as well when it comes to group work and inclusive assessment strategies particularly group and teamwork can i recommend and i will share with uh, mamish afterwards to share with you is katie bodie's work and she's produced a framework toolkit to support academics in facilitating group work she did a massive piece of research um, in the uk and europe um, and America looking at group work in engineering and what she was observing. Just hold on a second. I just need to tell a dog to be quiet who seems to think she can cry. Quiet, settle. Is the piece of what she did was she observed, she observed, observing groups all over Europe and America um, in these massive projects that the girls were being sidelined into project management roles rather than using their technical skills in group work. The girls are still achieving two ones and firsts, 
but when you interview them at the end of their degree, they don't feel technically competent, so they don't progress into an engineering career. Plus, equally on their employment application, they talk about project management instead of leadership. So it's absolutely imperative her work highlighted, and I've, you know, staff developed staff is about staff picking up on that when the groups are formulated, you know, who's doing the leadership, who's doing the project management, they should be rotating that role. <clears throat> and it shouldn't be the girls being sidelined into that project management leadership role. So it's absolutely important you as a facilitator and as an academic is picking up on that and encouraging that role swapping and I picked up on it this semester with our first year students when I was giving them some feedback on our currently on their group final as they prepare for the final submission so we were in semesters at the moment and I picked up that some of the girls had ended up in this project management role and they were you know they'd not felt so comfortable in doing some of the technical side and I, and, and, and I turned around to the group and I was blatantly honest to the boys and the girls I said to the girls right next time you do group work you are not doing the project management and the chip you're going to get your hands dirty in doing, and it's not necessarily dirty, but getting on with the technical side, contributing on the technical side, volunteering for more of that technical side attributes that needs to be done in the project in the next semester. And I turn around to the boys and I says, and you need to take on some of the project leadership management because you're missing that skill set. And I explained about Katie Bovey's work. So it's, you know, very honest with them. And they accept that. They recognise, oh, yes. You know, this is equally important both ways. Our students today are far more passionate coming through about a fairer society and social justice and sustainability and are far more engaged now about equality and diversity. So actually, when you challenge them very early on in their first year, if they do do something that's not appropriate, and the students, their peers will call it out and you address it and don't run away from it, they will take it on board. They recognise that they're in a safe environment in the university space and that we've called it out and this is an opportunity to learn from it to move them forward because we know they are aware that we're trying to help them to be a better person for their future careers and supporting them in their future opportunities. And I have to be fair, the environment we've managed to create, the girls' confidence is immense. So when we did have a misogynistic incident in early on in semester one, we were able to deal with it internally as a school and we addressed it. And the student was invited into one-to-one -one and he, he understood what he needed to do. He apologised to the student and, you know, he's been working on that. So we have a real opportunity to shape things. So I hope that gives you some thoughts about that assessment. Some of the other things that, um, and I think Mamish will invite some of my academic colleagues to talk about some of the inclusive assessments that we've done, um, which are playing against the strengths and that they'd be best presenting some of the results of that. And it has been really positive work with our coming out of Brexit, um, out of COVID was that we now do online, there's an online exams we do in maths and we have pulled together a massive pool of questions, applied questions, um, using Blackboard. And the students have historically during COVID, but we've carried on with the 24 hour style, style exam. It's probably not 24 hours now. I think we're, we're restricting it to more 12. But the students can take two attempts of it. It's fixed timed anyway. The moment they started, they've got to complete it in fixed time. All students are given extra time of part of that fixed time. So allowing for students, some students having their learning support plans, some students not declaring their disability and therefore not having an LSP, or students who are still in the process of getting their LSP. So we've taken the approach, all students get extra time. So we've written the exam that would be normally for an hour and everybody gets an hour and a half. They can take that test exam twice in the time, it's set out over a 12, 24 hour period. So we're saying to the students, if you're an early bird, do it in the morning at six o'clock in the morning. If you're a late a night owl, go and do it in the evening when it's your strength and your brain is functioning. And you've got two attempts and we'll take and the system will take whichever's your best attempt. We also have a mock one, so it also pulls from pool of questions up to a week before the exam. 
they can sit and mock exams so they're prepared for that and we've really noticed the improvement of adopting that approach has reduced that attainment gap rewarding gap and um, the model you know is more evened up so all minorities characteristics we look at disability we look at um, black attainment gap um, we look at um, low social economics we look at mature students and we, that's all evening out with providing an opportunity so it works around students who've got caring responsibilities in a more inclusive way i will end there so that gives you an insight to some of that level of curriculum involvement we've done and we're work in progress and we're carrying on with that and i would recommend bring in Shumi and Hani sometime to talk about that particular assessment that we've been doing because they can really show you the module results but it's getting you to challenge you to think about your assessment and the impact you can have on your peers or students and working together and particularly the other side to that is about that social capital about building relationships with students because the more you build relationships with students and this is the work I did at my previous institution and the academics did we had no award. we had no black awarding gap in the subject area i managed because of working closely with the students building relationships developing their social capital engaging them in their studies helped all students progress in their learning Okay, great. Thank you so much, uh, Anne. It, it's a fantastic talk. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions, if anybody has for, for Anne. Um, I certainly have, but I'll hold, hold back my questions if anybody else would like to take the microphone or type their question in the chat while somebody else is speaking. Um, was it in-house knowledge? Um, no. So some of it, yes, because of what I did at my previous institution in trying to address um, the black attainment warding gap and the work I did there. Um, and that was work I've been working on since 2012-13 I've been involved in. Now, because I was developing a school from scratch, I went around the world, <laughs> literally, I went around Europe, um, visiting places and some of the work that's been doing. I read the literature. But I also learned from a lot of the work that's been done in research that's been trying to address EDI in the employment sector. So going to the West Conference, now everybody was moaning how bad it was and saying, actually, has anybody got any solutions here? You know, from the employers and start applying a lot of that work into what we did. So that's how we've been doing the recruitment processes. So I do recommend going to the literature. Delph has done some fantastic work. Research doesn't mean they've applied it in their institution. They've done some fantastic research. OK, so anybody else would like to take the microphone or put their question in the chat um, while somebody's making up their mind. I have a question. You you mentioned about, uh, you know, taking the test and I see another comment in the in, in, in that uh, in chat about that as well, like taking the test twice. So is it the same test or is it different test? And, and so it's a different test work? because it's so it's a big pool of questions, which you can imagine that's the hard part for the staff is creating this massive pool. So they get a random, so every set of students, every student gets a different random set of questions. So when they take the second test, they get another random set of questions, but they're all meeting the learning outcomes of the module. And, and students don't uh, come back and say, oh, that test was easier, this test was easier. You know, they don't have any issues like that because they're set in a certain way that they are all at the same level. Um, all students moan that exams are horrible. Um, but they do prefer that exam approach that they have a second bite of the cherry. Um, it helps them with the students with that self-doubt. Um, and I say, I would, I would strongly re recommend inviting Shumi and Hani who have written a paper on the work and the results they've done and the analysis of it, of where they can demonstrate whether, you know, the first sits was better than the second sit but they've got some really good feedback from the students from that 
So I'd recommend that. Um, the question about um, what was the lessons learned that surprised me the most? I think that has to go back to my previous institution when we, when I reanalyzed the year set of results and suddenly there was no awarding gap or attainment gap for black and Asian students. And I actually went round asking the staff, the team, what did you do? And they just went, oh, we invited the students to our engineering cafe that we have where we work on problems that aren't to do, you know, aren't module assessments, but related to the modules. We made a real effort to make sure the black and Asian student came along. So it's about social capital. And that's been the big, and that's something I've learned when I went up at Kingston University recently um, for an EDI event for life sciences. And that's what we're missing the trick. That's the research that's now coming out is our low social economic students, our black and Asian students are being denied that social capital when they're at university. You're, it's either happening consciously or unconsciously. And we need to make more of an effort. So the more we build that kind of relationship, academic, you know, that tutoring relationship, um, encouraging the students to do the more extracurricular side of things, um, will make makes a huge difference. It supports the students. It encourages them to be part of it and want to engage in their studies and the reading around and that sense of belonging because otherwise if people don't feel they belong they drift and it's the same in the group work um some of the work we did i did at my previous institution was taking judith shawcross work who produced um examples for cambridge engineering students who were going out on placement they were upsetting the placement providers by the way they were speaking so she said she showed them you said this and you got this angry head if you rephrase it you'll get this lovely polite head and i was observing our students were doing exactly the same in group work um so i now at my current institution my previous institution we share judicial cross work with the students and said language matters so first pass post competition approach creates a very aggressive atmosphere and that aggressive language actually results in people being switched off and drifting out of group work so i've highlighted those students who want to do really well and get very competitive that actually your language is impacting the other students learning actually you're stopping them from learning and that you need to change and think about how you're failing if you're not helping them to be part of the group so it's helping them realize team working is important their skills and their communication skills will have a direct impact on student engagement excellent thank you so much that's uh, um is there any further questions or are we okay to uh, move to the next presenter i know it's my name on the list but i'm i'm going to step backwards and allow um or rather invite uh, uh, Fiona, who's from UCL, to, to take that slot for now, because um, and then I'll do my session later on. So Fiona, uh, thank you so much, Anne. Uh, maybe, maybe we can express our, our, our uh, it's some clapping. I don't know if it's, it's not possible from, uh, but there is, a, there is an emotion, emoticon. I'm using that right now. But thank you so much for sharing your wonderful work with us. Um, and uh, Fiona, if you can try sharing your slides next, we can move on to yourself for the session. And please take your 30 minutes to introduce yourself, your work, and for Q&A, like we did for this first part. Brilliant. Thank you, Manish. OK, so hopefully you should all be able to see my slides and everything. Yes. Um, fantastic. Uh, so I'm a lecturer with the Integrated Engineering Programme. I promise I will explain all of this terminology for those of you who have not um, heard of the IEP before or what engineering challenges is but I am not based within uh, any of the departments within the engineering faculty um, I work across the board um, and my specialist subject is um, interdisciplinary teamwork uh, and I'm also the student support lead for the IEP so I'm very interested in how do we make 
our courses as inclusive as we possibly can for students. Um, so a brief introduction for those of you who've not seen the IEP before, don't know what it is. Um, it's our uh, cross faculty teaching framework. So the vast majority of our undergraduate programs in some way engage with this framework. Um, the engineering faculty at UCL covers such stuff as the School of Management, uh, sec Security and Crime Science, we've got Medical Physics, we've got Computer Science, uh, Mechanical, Biochemical, Chemical, Biomedical, all of the kind of engineering disciplines that you can kind of uh, come up with. And so obviously anything we do has to be somewhat flexible and tailored to each of these different disciplines. Um, so the vast majority of our programs engage in some way in this process. And this is our framework. I have to say it's not to scale as much as I would love the teamwork in the middle. So challenges S1, S2, S3. These are all our teamwork opportunities for students. It looks like it's like 80% of their degree. It's really not the discipline technical stuff, which is done in their departments. It's their, you know, the, the, the typical engineering teaching is really what's about 80% of their degree. Um, and you can see we've got maths that's taught across the faculty as well as something called design and professional skills, which really does what it says on the tin. It teaches design and professional skills. And the reason we brought this um, framework in is because we really wanted to move to include specific space for skills learning for students. It's something that came up in discussions with employers was what they they knew we were UCL. We could definitely teach the technical. That's cool. But what they the kind of added extra that they would really like is if we could give students opportunities to display these skills, to practice these skills, to say, come into interviews having already done it and they knew what was going on. So this was our approach to build in teamwork opportunities where students could work on projects. They could demonstrate not just teamwork, but presentation, problem solving, critical thinking, all of that kind of thing. Also bring that technical knowledge into the kind of project space that engineers tend to work in. And then we would explicitly teach stuff, you know, in the classroom around how do you construct a presentation? What are the kind of basics that you might need to think about in terms of teamwork? So that's how these two kind of go along. What's really interesting for us is the introduction of a lot of projects allows us to actually uh, build in quite a lot of contextual consideration for students. So not only are they solving a problem in a project, but we can put that problem into a place, into a set of users and get them to think about the sustainability or the ethics or the cultural context of what they're working on. We can start building that in, in a relatively, I would say, natural way. <laughs> I'm not going to suggest we've gone full authentic problem solving necessarily, certainly from the beginning, but it's provided us this space. And the module that I work on engineering challenges is right at the beginning. It's our intro module to project work, to teamwork and that kind of stuff. Uh, and that's the one I lead. And we've built, started building in how we kind of do some of this teaching. So for us, the concept, how we kind of have tried to bring in the concepts and, and think about them within the context of the IEP and our, our student cohort around justice, equality, diversity and inclusion is the part of how do we make our teaching and learning accessible, but we also are interested in how do we teach our students these concepts. As Anne talked about, our students are going to be creating things that impact the world. You know, the, um, UCL's uh, engineering faculty's slogan is change the world for a reason, right? We, we are understand what we're kind of, um, that what our students will be involved with and stuff like AI, chat GPT, you know, all of these things. And we are the point where students can start thinking about ethics before they necessarily go out into the wider world. But one thing I really need to mention, and it is our big challenge at UCL, is scale. Um, so Engineering Challenges is our biggest module within the faculty. It's the biggest module at UCL, as far as we can find. We cover seven departments and 950 students take the module. So anything we do has to work at an enormous scale. Uh, it is just kind of um, massive what we work on. And this is one of the big challenges for us 
in terms of making our teaching and learning accessible is the sheer number of different ways we might do it and what we need to how, who we need to support how we need to support them and a lot of certainly the advice i've received from our student well-being pro, um, uh, service is where well, you have a conversation with the student you talk about it which is fantastic except you know, I've got 950 students, so I need to try and make a conversation and a connection with that well, enough that they feel comfortable to disclose what's going on in their lives. And this is a really tricky um, thing that we need to talk about. And I do have a lot of academics that work with me. There's about, we have a teaching team of 20 academics and about 50 PGTAs. But again, this is a really tricky um, thing to negotiate. And the other aspect to UCL's cohort is we're about 50% international students. So we are we have a lot of students who come from very different backgrounds and they come from places where attitudes towards stuff like mental health can be very different to what we we our attitudes in the UK. And that is another thing that we are attempting to negotiate and, and try and support students through and bring when we bring these students together. So I don't think we've we've certainly got stuff that we need to improve, but I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've done. Uh, so far and what and our kind of approach to some of this stuff. So just to briefly I'll give you a little bit more detail on engineering challenges. As I said, it's taken by seven departments. It's a team project work module. It's first term, first year, which brings its own challenges. It's 10 weeks. Our team project is actually only seven weeks. We spend three weeks introducing students to the overwhelming life change that is coming to university um, and helping them support them through that process entering their department finding out what is electrical engineering <laughs> is it what they thought it was who are these people who are teaching them and as i said everything is tailored with day-to-day -day teaching done by um, academics within the department. And it's really fun because the students build a physical model. Very, as you can see, one of them's made from spaghetti, not necessarily the world's most complicated, uh, sophisticated prototype, but we actually get the students doing the kind of act of engineering right from the beginning, which really actually helps them engage with this process because to, for some, quite a few of them, that's what they wanted to do. That's they wanted hands-on getting dirty in the process. Uh, and to give you just an idea of how our assessment pattern does, we have a very structured assessment pattern. I think if the, the comment we get most often when talking about engineering challenges is how highly structured the module is. And that is a consequence of the scale of the module. And also being able to put in enough support. We um, Quite a lot of our students, probably about 50% of our students have not had assessed teamwork before. They don't necessarily know what they're doing and as I said 50% of our students are international students a large percentage of those are working not in their first language and so this is it's it's a very much a quite steep learning curve but we want to support the students in this so the approach we've taken is very much a quite highly structured project um, very typical if you do project long long-term project work there's the kind of midpoint presentation then there's the live demonstration at the end and the final report but the two that are maybe a little bit less obvious are where we've got IPAC criteria and we use IPAC. So IPAC is a piece of software we developed within uh, the engineering faculty. It's called Individual uh, Peer Assessed Contribution to Teamwork is what the, the acronym stands for. And it's students peer assessing, providing feedback to each other uh, as a way of uh, giving students within the teams a little bit more of an individualized say. It's a, it's a nice way for students to feedback. Um, I've seen some fantastic comments on not, it's not just kind of, you know, you might expect, oh, they were terrible, they were useless, but the students are actually very positive. You know, if they've had a fantastic time, they would be like, you were amazing, this was great. And that's really useful for building up students' confidence as well, I think, in the, this something that's very unusual and new to them. And then the other assessment that's maybe a bit unusual is the social impact report. So this is where we explicitly have started building in, getting students to think about um, things like ethics, things like cultural context within and, and how that relates to their engineering work, how, what, how these might affect their project, what kind of stuff is going on there. And we have, as I said, we have very structured teamwork. We put this in for all students, but it's, I think, particularly useful for those students who, for example, you know, we're coming in from different cultural expectations about how to how to work. 
Um, we've also put this in for students who maybe find working with other people anxiety inducing or have, have find it tricky. We've The aim here is to really explicitly say, these are the processes, these are our expectations, this is what you need to do uh, in this process. Uh, and it, as I said, it's beneficial for all students. So as I said, we have the, the module design and professional skills. So before the students start doing their team project, we they have a two hour session with me where I go through things like conflict happens in teamwork. Yeah, it's, you know, if you, you know, if there's some conflict, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You need to communicate. Here's how to think about communication. Here's how to think particularly about cross-cultural communication. You know, your expertise, your ideas, your experiences are all going to impact on what you're doing in that. Uh, and then we also explicitly talk about how to divide up tasks, what we our thoughts on leadership are, for example, we really encourage students not to have a team leader. We really encourage them to break down that leadership and, for example, lead on the demonstration or lead on the project report. Right. And that's leadership there. You're not necessarily a kind of dictator telling the rest of the team what to do. It's this con kind of consensus building is what we're looking for. So we really start talking about that. We also have a design and professional skills module that happens in year two and I come back to the students in year two when they're doing further project work and say, OK, let's actually unpack why conflict happens within teamwork. Now you've got some experience. Let's really think through these situations and and how other people are working differently. And as Anne said, we use um, Gallup Strengths Finder. We really picked that because what we were really interested in is for students to have a language that they could talk to each other about how they preferred to work. And it really does work very well. Um, we find students, you know, um, obviously, you know, there's a broad range of engagement with the process. We have students who say, that's not me. We have students say, you know, that's not what engineers should be. We really try to make the point that um, you know, engineers can be anything and, and a lot of engineers have a lot of people skills. Engineering is surprisingly people based, really. But it also allows students to say, well, actually, that's why I'm clashing with that other person is because I want to be highly organized and they want to be leaving every change up to the last minute. And this is bringing conflict into our relationship rather than it becoming a personal relationship. So that's that's useful. I don't as I said, it doesn't remove all personal conflict. The, the scale of the module means that there's always something, but it does help um, our students to kind of have facilitate that discussion. And we're particularly aware that we're working with a lot of 18 year olds who maybe have never really had to have that discussion or maybe necessarily that self reflection process. You know, I think we can all remember being teenagers and going, I am definitely right. <laughs> you know, I know what I'm doing. I'm an adult now. So it, it does help them with that process. Uh, and as I said, we give them expectations. This is what we want a team member to be. This is what we expect a team lead to do. So we don't expect you to be doing that. We do expect you to be doing this. Um, conflict does also often come up with lack of communication. So we give the students communication tools. So we get them to do meeting minutes. We say you have to meet every week. Here is a spreadsheet that breaks down what you need to do. We also give them a Teams channel and say you need to do some collaboration. Teams is what people collaborate on quite often. We use Teams because we, you know, bought the the site license for it at UCL. So that's where we're coming from. So this is really helpful, as I said, for all students. But I think it does help to reduce the anxiety again for all students about what is the expectation of teamwork. Um, and in general, particularly within the first year module, we're as flexible and as generous as we can be. If we can give a student some extra time in a demo and be like, ask, ask some leading questions in a live presentation, we we will um, if we can. Obviously, with this scale and to try and make it as fair as possible across the board, we kind of can't make um, kind of endless changes to the way we do it. We also, unfortunately, the, the double test thing sounds fantastic, but um, if you're marking 950 social impact reports, it's a lot of work <laughs> for us. So there is a little bit of a limit resource as to a resource limit as to how how much we can kind of go here. We also use a range of assessment types. We use stuff like recorded presentations, team presentations. We do written reports. We do template reports. Um, we do peer assessment with students and we explain to students why we get them to do peer assessment and how. And we we do it in a, a variety of different places. 
and and stuff like IPAC is used throughout their programs as well so it's not just within it's an introduction within my module but we use it uh, student advisors is a term that we have at UCL it's a fantastic resource that's very new to us and I love uh, so we have a member of student support team so the central student support team is um, assigned to each department so they're sort of embedded in one or two departments and they are seeing students on a, a regular basis so I have a meeting with them I say this is what's on the module this year this is how it functions this is what's going on um, and they're able because they're outside of the kind of marking hierarchy students are much more open with them and because they've already got a relationship with me they can then kind of come to me and say, this student is struggling with this, as long as this, obviously, as long as the student is happy for, for them to get in contact or a kind of generic, this issue has come up um, in this kind of place. So um, that is helpful. And we can then also advise students to talk to them if they need to have mitigation or if they're struggling. And the student advisors have uh, you know the skill set to be able to really support their students they know how all UCL support systems work they can feed them in so we're in kind of quite not constant contact but we're always available and, and teams messaging has really <laughs> helped with that we can kind of message people and just sort of go oh I've got a concern about this student and it may be a student that they already know is in the system and that's really useful and also when uh, Sora is a um, I've probably you've all got something similar summary of reasonable adjustments so these are students with a diagnosed medical condition and we start lines of communication with all our Sora students to explain that this is a teamwork module. It's as uh, teamwork is still considered somewhat unusual at UCL, even though, I mean, we in engineering use it extensively. So it can be that our central use, um, student wellbeing team are not so au fait as to what happens in all of the different modules. Some of our adjustments can be a little bit generic, which is something we're in communication with them about, about how we could get more advice. Um, and so we talk to the students and we do try and start those conversations specifically with those students as, as, as much as we can and say, look, you know, if there's something that would be helpful, please let us know. Although, uh, you know, one of the, the issues we have is we're a first term, first year module. Relatively few students have SORAs in place uh, because relatively few students necessarily come in with a diagnosis, particularly those international students and relatively few of, you know, we get certainly students who were coping and then the big life upheaval that is university sort of means that they're in a very different place and, and you know, it kind of exasperates something that was maybe already there or kind of highlights something that was maybe already there. And these things do take time. You know, the NHS is not very quick at providing um, a diagnosis, for example. So we're also looking into how do we make sure, you know, really actually everything is as accessible as we can and, and what are the limits to what we can make flexible? And we push those boundaries as much as we possibly can. Um, and so just to mention, because this is the assessment I teach on and run directly, so it's my baby, is the social impact report. Um, it's something that we've recently brought in. It was a kind of response to the uh, pandemic because we couldn't kind of, we used to run a kind of sort of discussion meetings where students would share progress on on their project. And then we'd start kind of bringing in the concepts of cultural context or ethics. And we had to put this stuff online and we initially created it as an asynchronous piece of um, uh, uh, assessment. And we've now added a live workshop that's tied to this individual assessment. And we provide students with a report. So it's basically, we give them a tool. So if you're looking at cultural context, it's stakeholder analysis. If you're looking at ethics, you've got to identify some harms. If we're looking at risk and security, you do a PESEL analysis. Um, so really make it feel a little bit more engineering because we, because the one of the issues is the students have a very science maths background, and so they're not so used to having to kind of work in the grey areas of, you know, these this judgment call and this kind of um, kind of work, the, the grey areas of ethics. We then get them to pick two things from their tool and go, actually, can you explain that? Can you talk about mitigation? And then we go, okay, beyond the tool, because we all know that ethics is more than you know what harms are happen cultural context is more than what stakeholders are can you give us some ideas and this is all relatively kind of bullet pointy 
single paragraphs, um, three or four sentences, because it is very much an introduction and there are subsequent teaching for the students on these areas and they will do it in subsequent project work. So it's very much an, an intro process. One of the things I found quite interesting this year is I use Mentimeter. I absolutely recommend Mentimeter as an engagement tool for large groups of students. It's fantastic. I use it when I teach ethics um, at master's level as well, because it's anonymous. The students can put their ideas, they can put what they're talking about. And we know these topics, things like ethics, cultural context can be a little bit difficult for students to discuss. So I really recommend tools like Mentimeter. But what I used it in the social impact to do is challenge the students' assumptions. So here I've asked them a relatively straightforward I guess a science question, what is tuberculosis? Most of them understood there was a bacteria, but then when kind of challenging their assumptions about, so I should say our, our project work is based in Uganda. Um, it's something we, we wanted to, to put it so that was really got the students to think about what they were doing. So we're building a tuberculosis vaccine production plant in Uganda. We've been um, with the same project for eight years now and um, it's really interesting how what the students' attitudes towards um, people outside of their own experience are. There are some interesting and quite dated stereotypes that our students sometimes come up with. So for example, um, I asked them, what is the literacy rate in Uganda? And I've taught this, we teach this with 12 groups of 12 groups of students, 80 in each time. I've yet to have one of them correctly state that it, you know, that a majority of the students say that it's it's 76 percent, which is what it is in Uganda. They tend to have this assumption that, you know, um, people aren't going to school. They they can't read and write, which is actually quite false and, and quite, as I said, quite dated. Um, and so we are looking into how we might start challenging those assumptions and really um, getting the students to really think through you know a lot of this information is online they can find this information it is something you can look up so how we might incorporate that into our teaching so in summary uh, we have made some progress there are obviously big areas that we still need to improve on we're working on things like faculty-wide guidelines on teamwork. Um, we're looking into how we can improve our support for SORA students and disabled students in general. But, you know, the big issue we always have is that we're at scale. It's a huge scale. We're also across a lot of departments. We have to, I don't know how many of you have tried to get 20 academics to agree on something. It's very tricky. Um, <laughs> and not even seven academic departments to agree on something. Very tricky. Um, and student expectations are, are can be quite tricky. You know, there is certainly a percentage of our students who expect engineering to be some some hard maths and some science and so it, it, they sort of go oh, well why am I talking about social impact or why do I have to think about teamwork and that how we we kind of we've again done some work on bringing alumni in bringing people from you know mechanical engineering team bring in formula one engineers um, and say and they talk about teamwork all the time uh, and so you know, we're still working on that, but it's it's really interesting what our students, some of our students are expecting walking into uh, an engineering degree for